say to be in the country. So I'd been illegal from then, from 2006. Wow. Were you not scared that you'd be deported? If you I used to even go to... I used to write, keep diaries where I'm like, I want to kill myself. I want to end my life because of everything that I was going through. Like, I did not want to be in this world anymore. And oh, you're making me so sad. I don't want to cry. Oh, I don't want you to be sad. <laughs> I should I'm have not cried on my channel. Before, like... before getting to the good part, because oh, I, I mean, I, I can... say some of the things. I got pregnant at a young age, 15 and 16. I went through a miscarriage and... Hey. Stop that. <laughs> Hey. Hello. But this story is quite it's quite strange. It's quite weird. So I was scrolling through YouTube and then I saw a video of a lady, this beautiful lady, talking about how she lived in the UK illegally or without papers for a while. I decided not to watch the video. I just decided to contact her and see if she would like to share the video on my channel. As most of my viewers are immigrants, we'll learn a few things from this story, I believe. So meet Frances, the beautiful Frances. I'll leave a link to her YouTube channel in the description, and then I'll leave a screenshot of how it looks like, so you can head over as well and then see what she has to offer on her channel. So welcome to my channel, Frances. Thank you, thank you. It's lovely um, getting on your channel because um, I've been watching your videos and oh. the information that you share out to people. Um, so I know that you're helping so many people in so many ways, yeah. Oh, nice to hear. What made you do a video to talk about the fact that you've been living in the UK illegally? What made you do that? Um, well, there was a recent change in the immigration law. This was in December. And I actually had been thinking about like YouTube um, for a while, but I always thought, or maybe the platform, there's too many people on there. Like, what do I have to share? Um, but then when there was this change, I thought, what better way to kind of get this information out there than to share my story? Because I've been on other platforms um, where I've shared my story and I thought YouTube is, has an audience that can reach many people in many different places. Um, so yeah, that's literally why I said, I want to start, um, it was it was a bit nerve wracking thinking about it at first, like getting in front of the camera, but I thought of the better good that will come out of it. And I thought, why not just do it? So tell us, how did you end up becoming an illegal immigrant in the UK? How? How does it happen? Like, <laughs> So I actually came as a child. I was 13 years old. And um, when did I came... Come, did you come on a visit visa? Yes. So I came on a visit visa. I was brought here as a child. And I didn't know anything about like immigration or having status because I was a child, I, I didn't know anything. And when it was time for me to like go to university, like I had an idea of like, maybe I'm not on the same radar as people when I got to college, but then when it was time to like apply for university, then I kind of realized the extent of it. Like you're literally illegal. You can't go to university, you can't access student loans. Like simple things that other people can access you can't access it so from the six months visa obviously i didn't have um stay to be in the country so i'd been illegal from then from 2006 wow so how were you going to school how were you able to enroll in school then I had no I I had no idea because obviously I I was a child all of these things were done for me I was put into school when I was brought here I was um if you actually watch my story I kind of talk a bit about this where I um share you know um being left with someone that I didn't really know and um you know the things I was going through not being treated nice and my teachers in school kind of noticing and contacting social services so many other things that I actually but I'll leave people to actually go and watch the video to kind of get more information on all of this so that means when you came on a visit visa you were not living with your parents in the uk no no but i was brought here by my dad okay and he left yeah. back to your country yeah he'd gone back home yeah and where's home for you sierra leone home sierra, sierra leone yeah yeah the first sierra leonean on the channel yeah oh really yeah. <laughs> oh wow so were you living with like a family or so the person that I initially um, got left with wasn't like uh, my blood relative. And then when I was in year 11, so just before going to sixth form, I had to leave her house. And then I went to live with family, my grandma and my uncle at the time. And things didn't work out. I ended up getting kicked out. Um, when I was 17 years old but um you know like when you when you when people listen and actually watch the video they'll understand like the grace of God upon I'm a Christian if people 
are watching and I believe in God and with everything that's happened to my life I know like where I am he's brought me and that's more the reason even why I share my story because put that I'm in brain. so how are you able to did you have a GP how are you able to go to the hospital I because think I was registered with a GP um I was able to open my bank account without papers yes <laughs> I actually went to uni without papers I ended up getting my my status like at the end of my second year going into my third year at university but I talk all about this all in my YouTube videos if you get onto you understand the story of Honestly, I oh, we, we, need, we need we need some meat for this video as well. <laughs> like you've not said anything at all yet. So like, I know. so when did you when did you first realize that you were an illegal immigrant? Because like you said, you were young. You didn't know initially. Yeah, it was when I actually went to um, college. That's when I understood. Like um, to sixth form, that is from from year eleven now to sixth form. Like oh, I'm not. I don't really have status, but when I when I was in my second year now applying to university, that's when because even at that time you like okay you don't have papers, but you don't understand the extent of it because you're a child, you know it, it, it and getting information as how it is now it wasn't the same back then this was like 2009 2010 you know there wasn't so much information or people sharing information out there back then, um so I I actually applied for student loan and got. Um, told that you know I, I can't get access to it um, so yeah so that's when I knew like I but I first knew that I don't have the same status as people when I was like um, going to sixth form but you were able to register with a GP to receive yeah someone re well the I think the person whom I was left with they'd registered me to a GP but I think this were times where there wasn't looking so much like now things are a bit more stricter where you can't register to a GP without having status you can't rent a, a house and things like that but I think that I and when I moved in um with my grandma I think I went to register myself at a GP practice and registered myself at a dentist a dental practice yeah but at the time it wasn't so strict like you said like I yeah can't. like things are a bit more yeah. difficult now yeah i mean i was able to open a bank account without status now people can't do that That's true. and even at the time i don't think you you were able to like you had to um to go with um like a form of document if you had a passport it had to have your stay in it because at the time they used to stamp it on your passport but i only had a, a, a ordinary passport there was no stay in my passport whatsoever i literally walked into the bank and i said the most they can tell me is no you can't do this but why not try that's always been like my motto in life it's like why not try anyway the most that they can say to you is no and at what age were you then when you were opening the bank account I think I was 16, 17. And you did it with your Sierra Leonean passport? Yep, with my Sierra Leonean passport. So I couldn't go to uni. Um, and then I went, I looked for uh, courses. What could I do? And at the time I used to do hair, like I used to do my own hair, do people's hair. So I decided to do a hairdressing course in that year. So one day I was eating lunch whilst doing this course. And I found a leaflet and it was from a charity that said, if you were going through some of the issues on there, they could help you. I called the charity and... Um, they ended up getting me um, with a caseworker. I explained my situation. The caseworker then um, sent an email to another organization that used to do like food bank at the time. And they used to give out clothing and uh, toiletries to people that needed it. Um, and the person who received the email in that charity then sent an email to everyone that sponsored that charity. I ended up getting like a two suitcases full of things i got like up to 500 pounds and one of the people on that email list is a lady called karen marshall and she's the sister to a man called martin marshall and martin marshall is the founder of marshall scholarship so they contacted me say they would like to get to know more about me um um, because the, the scholarship was offering scholarship to students in South Africa and Israel at the time, but they wanted to start it in the UK. I replied them, they asked for like a personal statement, which I sent. And then like a week later, they asked to meet me in Starbucks and they had all this document drafted. And it said that they were going to pay for me for three full year of scholarship to wow. go to uni covering my living expenses my tuition fees and um, a living allowance as well every month and I literally burst out in tears I could not believe it literally and I was the first student in the UK to get the scholarship I ended up writing a report for them and opening the doors for them to like um 
give the scholarship to like three, four more students. Um, it just turned out to be a bit more expensive, like having students here in the UK. But now the scholarship is still in South Africa, Israel and the Ukraine. And they have about 250 students in each country. But uh, that's how I went to uni. <laughs> Can you leave us the details of these this charity and then I'll put it one hundred percent. All and in all of my YouTube videos where I share more about my story, I leave all the details of all the charities that have helped me. Um, I, I also I also actually work for a charity now that works with refugees, um, asylum seekers, and that is obviously based on my experience. I want to be able to help other people, so like I leave that in the description. I always and any other like. Um, charities and organization that I've worked with that are there to help people give advice I always leave them like in the description of my video so uh, but I would obviously leave it here as well so people can um, contact and contact them and get as much help and advice as possible that could have only be God you know just only God only God that's what when I tell you my the whole story and even then I couldn't even go to uni that year the, the university refused to enroll me because they said that um when they checked with the home office I didn't have status in the UK and um I ended up going back to to redo new A levels applied for new universities one of them um said that there were two of them said that they will enroll me um based on an international basis but I was so active in trying to contact the home office even before I met my scholarship sponsors I used to write to the home office just like I want to get my status I want to be able to go to university I want to be able to work like I came well, out of were you not scared that you'd be deported if you? I used to even go to Luna House in Croydon. So the Home Office has Luna House where people go to report there. You go, you can go there to do your biometric. It's the most famous building that most people know for the Home Office. I, I, I just had this confidence in me. For me, I say it's God, but I just was like, "What's the worst that can happen to me?" what's the worst that can happen you know and I don't know I just had this courage to just I literally would go there and I'm like I want my status like and I used to when I'm in the right I used to write I used to even keep the receipts and um one day they wrote to one of those letters that I wrote wrote to them um actually let me give a bit of context with that is in 2010 my uncle that i was living with when i was living with my grandma he'd actually made an application to the home office for me but i was refused and then a reconsideration which was something that they used to do before they used to do reconsideration if you're refused and um to ask the home office to reconsider the decision that they'd previously made so that request was in the home office so i used to write to them based on that to say can you at least answer the reconsideration request? Let me know what's going on. Like, I want to move on with my life. And then they one day replied to that. Um, so when I then got the places to go to uni, one of the universities, the university I ended up going to, I took that letter with me. I don't even know. Something just said, just take the letter. And um, when I went to enroll, they asked for my passport, my documents. I said, I have no passport, but I have this letter. And they photocopied it and literally said to me, just keep us um, updated on what happened. I could not believe it because I literally thought there was no way they were going to enroll me. And they did. And... Um, so you ended up paying home fees? So no, international fees they paid for me. They paid international fees. Wow. Yeah. That's a very good charity. Wow. Uh, they spent a lot of money. And all the way to even when I got my stay, because I ended up getting um, a, pro, uh, a solicitor who... Um, took on my case on a pro bono basis but then we had to go to court so the home office did respond but it was in 2014 and they said I then had to start going to sign on so I started um, signing on and they also those, said that those who don't know what signing on means was it yeah, so let me say, so signing on is um, basically the home office's way of keeping track of you and knowing where you are. So um, I used to sign on like once a month, just going to a home office facility where they have home office um, enforcement team and you go there and you take like a piece of paper and they just literally just tick a box to say you were there at that time. So I used to have to sign on um, once every month, but there's some people who maybe do it twice a month or however long, but I used to do it once a month and it actually was it was a long journey because I was studying in Oxford at the time and then and then they used to send me to um to sign on in Croydon then they moved me to Hounslow and I had to sign on um but we appealed they gave me a right to appeal um the decision so my solicitor then used that as an opportunity to actually um say let's go to court and 
we had a very good case because I'd established a private life in the UK. I was already going to university. I wasn't dependent on the UK government or anything like that. So we ended up going to court and I'd won the case and then I was granted my status. Wow. When was that? So that was 2015. Actually, when we went to court outside of the court, the Home Office representative said to us that if it was up to him, he would give me my status there and then. And when we went into court, he never asked me any question. The um, judge just asked whether I would continue doing my charitable activities because I was doing a lot of charitable work, a lot of volunteering prior to that. So, yeah, that was the only question they asked me. And my scholarship sponsors were there to support me. And they were asked, like, lots of questions. And when and these people, it's not just, you know, they give money to um make sure that you go to university they build a relationship with you that they will take me out for my birthdays and christmas like check you know what i mean like literally like a family a family that i didn't have i was able to get in in them and i've just been so blessed from that honestly subscribe you went through a lot but yeah. i feel like your father or whoever brought you to the UK wanted mm -hmm. the best for you. They knew that the UK was a good place and mm -hmm. that's what brought you there. Yeah. But do you, do you hate them for doing that? Because they put you through a lot of stress. Mm, like, I so had a lot of resentment um, towards my father and we had a very, um, very toxic and bad relationship because I felt like a lot of the things you know I didn't even say some of the things I got pregnant at a young age 15 and 16 I went through miscarriage and you know and I blamed him for a lot of that trauma and a lot of what I went through and not having access to my mom even when I was in Sierra Leone I didn't have I didn't grow up with my mom and then now like I'm going through these things I don't have anybody there so I I blamed him on I I I definitely think that he had good intentions in doing so. I just feel like it's the way it was done. Um, that 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 was probably not the best way to do it. And um, so I, I had a lot of resentment, which I've had to deal with over time. And um, I would say that we are definitely in a much better place right now. But yes, I definitely did, you know, have a lot of resentment, a lot of um I don't know if, if I can say at some point hated them, hated him. Um, I it's, hate is a strong word, but I very much dislike him. And even when I was going through these things, especially with the person that um, I was left with at first when he brought me, I I was saying that I wanted to go home. If you watch the video where I actually explain about my story, I used to write keep diaries where I'm like, I want to kill myself, I want to end my life because of everything that I was going through. Like I did not want to be in this world anymore. And no child should ever have to. To go through that honestly like as much as you want the best for them i think there are ways in which you go about it um not to affect um that child and their trauma and have for them to have traumatic experiences oh you're making me so sad i don't want to cry oh i don't want you to be sad <laughs> I I'm should not have my channel like right? before getting to the good part because oh. I, I mean i cried if i don't want to cry oh. um in my Video. You know, usually when I see a video and then like I want to interview the person, I try not to watch the video because yeah. um, I don't want to know the story before I hear it again. Yeah, so exactly. that, like makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I can relate to what you went through in a way because I lived with my grandmother uh, mm -hmm. most of my life, mm -hmm. and then my parents also went to look for um, like um, green pastures in America, so they mm -hmm. left my grandmother mm -hmm. and um, for me my grandmother was good it was she was she was helpful but mm -hmm. um, she was old and there were some things that she could not do for us obviously mm -hmm. like um, meetings you know where they are inviting your family or where they're inviting let's say your parents and yeah. then everybody's mommy will be around and I wouldn't have mm -hmm. anybody to present me yeah. and we used to have some of those like programs a lot where they're expecting a parent or a relative and I don't have anybody and I'll be crying and all that I understand that part, but you were totally alone. Yeah. You were totally alone. You didn't have access to your mother. Your father had yeah. left you with somebody, and then you went through a lot. And at a tender age, you got pregnant, yeah. coupled with you wanting to go to school. And in the UK, where, see, what would you advise people? Like, if somebody is an illegal immigrant right now, mm -hmm. uh, God, God, actually, I don't even know what to say. God actually came through for you. You've been so lucky. 
Go on, they're blessed. And even through the process, like I now have an sorry to cut you. I now have an adopted family, um, you know, who took me in at the time when my grandma and my uncle kicked me out, and they're now my family. So even through all of that, I've been blessed with I always say the people who've helped me in life are not necessarily blood relatives, but they are my family. And I've been blessed with like my scholarship family and you know, my adopted family now. You're, 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 you've been so lucky that yeah. other people that have not been this lucky. There are some people yeah. that and I do you think the fact that you were brought in when you were younger and you did not like you were a minor. Do you mm -hmm. think the fact that um, you were a minor when you came in helped your case to get for you to get the papers later? Because there are some people that were above 18 when they came mm -hmm. on the visa mm -hmm. and then they're now illegal immigrants. Mm -hmm. Like you said, these days it's tough. If you it's difficult to get access to medical care, I've mm -hmm. heard of so many story, stories like that. What would you tell anybody like that, like anybody going through that now? It, it's difficult. Honestly, there were times where I, I didn't even have money for a bus pass. I literally remember going to the home office to, to cry there and I didn't have bus pass to come home. So I understand and I sympathize and with these people. Who, like I know some people who are illegal immigrants who don't have their status. And the first thing I would advise is to be to look for charity. There are one thing most people don't know is that there are actually charities out there that are willing to help. A lot of people are so scared that even to reach out to organizations that might be able to help you with food in terms of food bank might be able to give you advice there's some people's cases that if they have the right advice they'll be able to then apply and get their status but they're so scared and there's some people that maybe their cases are a bit more complicated but with these charities like the organization that i work for you have um uh, like a community with other people where you're able to share. There's some people uh, who have their status, they don't, they have no recourse to public funds. Um, so all of these people are able to meet like in a community, in, in an environment where you have people who share the same or similar experiences, you're able to get advice to understand, you know, how to go about fighting your case. And I think that's the first step first for people to take. If you are sitting there scared and thinking that the home office is one day just gonna come and hand your papers, it's not going to work like that because that's what I find with especially the older generation who maybe came here after they were 18 or 21. They're so scared to even reach out to these organizations and they're not going to contact the home office and say for them to them to deport you. If it's let's say I'm speaking to you who's watching this and maybe you're illegal, the, those charities are not going to tell the home office to come and take you away they are there to help you them they, they so a lot of the charities are able to give legal advice a lot of the charities are able to help you with mental health care so with counseling um some of them have food banks where you're able to get food um so the first thing i'll say is don't be scared if you look um through my videos there there are lots of charity and organizations that i've left there but the only can I leave your Instagram so that people can contact you personally? Yes, definitely. I get a lot of people sending me messages on Instagram. Also, my email is also open. Like, um, And I try as best, as much as possible to reply to emails. You know, I always say to people, I'm not an immigration advisor. I'm not qualified. I give advice and in the best way I can for my personal experiences um, and in any way that I can help, you know. But I think um, the first thing, as I said, is don't be scared. Look for people that can actually help there and accept that there is help the your status is not just going to come to you on your lap if you don't do anything honestly i think yes um I was I came here at a young age I was able to go to school and integrate to society which helped me a bit but because of my perseverance I didn't stop as much as things you know held me back I kept on pushing it wasn't easy to get up I honestly I used to go and, and uh, I used to go to look for charities go to Red Cross and other um, charities that were around at the time one of them was kids company to see if I could get help I didn't just sit down so you need to actually be proactive in 
trying to get your immigration status sorted. Um, actually try to look for organizations that can help, um, that can give advice. If you see somewhere they have phone, um, some of them, it might just be over the phone. And whatever information you can get from there will be able to help you. That's the first step that I would say for people to take. I know you've left a lot of the story out because you want to, you want us to head over to your channel and watch. And <laughs> I am going to spend the rest of the evening watching them myself tonight. Thank and guys, you guys should head over as well. Let me be a bit inquisitive. You said mm -hmm. you were kicked out by your grandma mm -hmm. and your uncle. Were they legal residents at the time? For yeah, them? British citizen. My uncle had, he's been overseas since the 80s and he's got um, a British citizenship. My grandma had indefinite leave at the time. So did they kick you out because you got pregnant at an early age? No, I, I actually, I don't even think they knew I was pregnant um, then. But um, from what my uncle, because obviously we had a conversation where he's apologized, you know, for everything. And we now How have... How old were you then when they kicked you out? How old I was were 17. You? I was 17. Were you, um, stubborn, was, were, you, were you stubborn, like at the time? Were you like a stubborn child? I, but previously to that, I, I would say that I was a bit stubborn and, you know, I had my ways. But actually at that time I was... I. I was going to church. I was going to church a lot of the time. And, you know, my uncle was in a dark place with certain things in his life. And he says to me, you know, that was the reason, you know, why, um, you know, he kicked me out at the time. But actually, you know, I used to go to, I, at that time I'd gotten serious because it wasn't um, long um, after I had a miscarriage that it happened. And when I had the miscarriage, you know, I remember running to church and crying, like, you know, um, like I don't have anybody around to talk to and I felt like you know it happened because um because of the decision I'd made the previous year when I'd gotten pregnant so you know I wanted God's help so at that time I was like trying to get um just leave leave right you know get closer to God and have a relationship with God so guys, if you are watching us and you are an illegal immigrant it's not the end of the world like honestly it isn't there is a way there, I, I, there are some people who are scared to there are certain things that you can get help i don't want to put it out there so people um so people uh, misquote me and i say anything wrong but there are certain help that you can get that you might think that you're not able to get the best thing for you to do is actually just reach out get help from an organization if you sit there it's not gonna get it's not gonna get better and it's not the it's honestly not the end of the world and sometimes people you feel so isolated you feel like it's just you that's go but sometimes you don't even understand how like i was because of the experiences that i was going through i realized that my best friend at the time she was going through the same experiences and i was able to link her with um um with the same charity that helped me um called the children's society and she was able to get access to a solicitor she even ended up getting her status before i did but like you know like people like her was able to get helped and i remember speaking to her for the first time and i'm like it's okay i understand because i'm in the same situation don't be scared to actually share so if you have people around you that you trust i would say because i know that sometimes people are scared that if they tell people around them they're going to call the home office on them but if you have people around you that you trust speak to them if you don't trust people enough reach out to these organizations honestly there are lots of help out there especially now there was a lot more help now than there was before for. I know for sure that the organizations are not supposed to report you to the home office because yeah. I have done my OISC level one. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's for good. Law course. I have okay. done the level one. I haven't written the exam yet, but mm -hmm. um, I can't run um, being a nurse and then being um, an immigration lawyer or mm -hmm. advice at the same time based on the visa that I'm on. So I'm waiting yeah. to get my indefinite and then I'll be a full immigration advisor. Okay. Yeah. So I know that like my lecturer told me that um, as an immigration advisor or whatever, if somebody that's illegal, that's, mm -hmm. that's a hard level one though. But then if somebody that's illegal contacts you, you are not supposed to report them to the home office as they are. Yeah. Immigration. So I know yeah. that the charities giving you a solicitor are not going to report you. That's what, if, if that's what people are scared of, like this, yes. Even the home office, based on their OISC, whatever, their rules, the lawyer is not supposed to report you to them. Yeah. 
I yes. definitely know my organization finds confidentiality. Exactly. You're not you, so yeah. don't be scared about it. Yeah. And my final question. Um, can I also share something? Sorry, I just want to share. This is this is the thing that actually made me decide to start the YouTube. Is that the Home Office um recently introduced a law um which they recently just changed again. I'm just ab about actually to post a video about it on my channel. Um, and if you were if you came to the UK as a child and um you've got your status between 18 and 24 and you've lived there for more than half your life and have had um, leave to remain under the private life for at least five years you can now apply for early indefinite leave to remain and this is information that a lot of people don't know about they, they actually initially introduced it in december as a concession but it's now been put into law um since june 2022 and you can now apply for early indefinite leave to remain um so yeah just if you are watching this and maybe you fit in that category i just want to give you the good news before i leave wow you have two kids I have a one, a daughter. You have one daughter. Okay. Yeah. So you had a daughter who was a British citizen, right? Nope. So my daughter gets whatever. So I am actually on the ten year route. So so this um new law oh, yeah. your your baby's father was not a citizen. No, not a British citizen, no. Okay. He's the Sierra Leonean. Okay. Yeah, in Sierra Leone. Oh, okay. So you went back there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so you you traveled to Sierra Leone? Yeah, so um, I've been traveling to Sierra Leone since 2016. The first time I went to see my mom. Um, um, I, so you had a baby after the after your uh, you got your papers. Yes. So after I got my papers, so okay. I went to my I went to Sierra Leone after I got my papers in 2015. I got it in October. I went to Sierra Leone in April. Saw my mom. Sadly, she passed away a few months after in September. Um, wow. Yeah, I went for the funeral and that's when I met my daughter's father. We got married in 2018. Um, it was a beautiful love story at the time, but um, sadly things have not worked out so well. Um, yeah. <laughs> wow, I don't want the video to be so, so long. So I'll just yeah. leave it there so that we can all head over and watch the videos. I'll be watching them personally. Yes. Uh, I have a feeling you'd have to come back. We'll do a part two of this. Definitely a part two. I mean, I have so much, like, I have experiences where, um, you know, I, my last um, renewal application, I made it myself, applied for my daughter's application. I've done a change of conditions application, um, a fee waiver application. So, so many, like, I, I have so much information on my channel and, you know, that I'm willing and able to share to people of all my experiences the things i've learned and you know working now in that sector as well all the things i'm learning every day and all the help that I'm, i can give to people freely that wasn't available to me at the time some people ask me if it's right for them to bring their kids when they're mm. coming because they know how childcare is in the UK, the struggles, mm -hmm. the problems. So they ask if I think it's a good idea for them to leave them with somebody they trust back home so that they can come here and then work. What would you say? It's a difficult one. It's really difficult. But for me, the experiences I've had not having my parents, you know, every step of the way growing up as a child, no matter what it is I face in life, I am going to have my child there. That for me, that's just it. You know, I've been through abuse. I've been through so many things and I don't, I don't want anything like that to happen to my child. I feel like the best way I can protect my child is if my child is there right with me. So I think if you, if you think that you're in the position where you can't afford to bring your child with you when you are traveling abroad um, and immigrating to another country, do it. If you don't feel like you're in a position where you can't take your child, don't do it yet. And wait until you are in a position where you can, because so much can happen to your child that can leave them traumatic and affect them in their later years. Um, having resentment towards you and maybe not wanting to do certain things, you know, as they grow up. There's some, there's some people I know now who don't want to have kids because of the experiences that they had as kids. So I think that until you feel like you're in the best position where you can give your child the best, um, and that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you're giving them everything financially, but being, but the best as in protection, care, love that that child needs until you feel like you're in that position i think maybe wait if it's money save up for that little bit more where you can afford for the tickets or the the application cost for you and your child or children 
Thank you so much, my sis. That's okay. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> leave Frances's channel, a screenshot of it here. You can head over and then watch and then listen to all these stories. And then you can contact yeah. her, leave her Instagram as well. Head over yeah. and contact her. Thank you so much. I've learned a lot. Thank I, you. Thank you for I, having I, me. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye.